Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination. Visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From recipes, motivational posts, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and the reader's favorite regular weekly posts, this and that, which goes live on the blog every Friday. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 300th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. And I cannot think of a better way to celebrate the 300th episode than by inviting a guest onto the show who has inspired me in so many different ways. And I have a feeling you as well when it comes to food and France. I'm talking about my guest, Susan Herman Loomis, and she will be joining us to talk about her new cookbook, which came out on January 12th, 2021. And let me just say, it is one to have and enjoy and use, and you will return to it again and again. We'll talk about why in our conversation today. So let me just paint a picture for you. I had the opportunity, as many of you know, to cook in Susan's kitchen in Louvier, as well as once in Portland. And when I went to Louvier in in the summer of 2019, I walked in for the first dinner, the welcome dinner. It was dusk. This is in Normandy in, in, in northern France, into her courtyard. Her turquoise bistro set is set up with savory olive cookies to nibble on, fresh French radishes from the market, flaky sea salt, salted butter, and glasses of crisp white wine. The Notre Dame Cathedral is right behind her house, and the silhouette and the shadows that it creates were just magnificent. Her honeysuckle along the stone fence that surrounds her home was full and in bloom and fragrant, and that set an amazingly delicious and inviting tone for the handful of days that we were there. And I want to give a quick shout out to Susie, my fellow student uh, in Susan's class with me. We had a great time. And um, and you'll find out why I enjoyed so much. I think when we you listen to her conversation with me today, she's a teacher. She knows her history as well as her food, and she loves France. And this cookbook will take you through the seasons. It will teach you how to go with the seasons as well and enjoy simple food full of flavor. So without further ado, let's get to that conversation. Returning to the show today is an American expat and international food expert and cookbook author who has called France home for nearly 40 years. With her new French cookbook, Plat du Jour, having just been released this January, Welcome back, Susan Herman Loomis. Shannon, I am so happy to be here with you, talking with you, and it feels like it was just yesterday that you were in Louvier. I know. I dream about all the food and conversations we had. That was a wonderful experience. I want to begin with your new cookbook, Plat Du Jour. Um, The dish is shared on handwritten chalkboards outside bistros and cafes in Paris, You've been working on this cookbook for more than a couple of years. What was the inspiration? Well, it's sort of um, because I live here and because I'm always out. And now I live in Paris as of really full time as of the last year and for two years kind of part time before that. So I was, you know, being in an urban environment, you're just constantly walking by restaurants. And I already had all that feeling of the farm, you know, the, the sort of main dish on the farm and the main dish in the country home. And I just realized, I mean, I, I just realized that it's all carried into the city in the plat du jour. 
And that really, France is a very small country. It's a very agricultural country. So you're never far from the farm. And the plat du jour always is telling you that because it's, it's based on whatever is best at the market that day. So I thought, you know, this is the kind of food people want to eat. You know, it's, it's robust, it's flavorful, it's sometimes slow cooked. And that's really got me going. I'm thinking this would make a great book. Mm. Well, and and that's what I love about um, your classes, having had two classes with you now, and also your previous cookbooks and books. You teach your students and your readers. You don't just get recipes, you teach us something. And that's what this book, the introduction, largely does. You talk about the formula of Plat de Jour. You talk about the history, as you just mentioned briefly. Can you talk a little bit more about what this history is What what and the formula um, for what exactly, for anyone who hasn't walked the streets of Paris and walked by the bistros, what is this formula and the history? Well, it goes back to the 1700s, really, when the first restaurant opened in Paris. And it was, people weren't really allowed to serve food publicly. But um, this restaurant opened, and it was really primarily for women. And it was kind of primarily for women who had very delicate health. So the first dishes were, was a broth, and um, it was meant a bouillon. It was a bouillon that people could come have. And, and a lot of women who had you know, who were weak and were out walking would go have a bouillon. And then it got to be, um, you know, and it was that bouillon was based on chicken. And then it got to be something a little more substantial. And so the really first recorded plat du jour is lamb's foot in white sauce, which, wow. you know, leaves a little to be desired in terms of our taste today. That would basically be um, a lamb's foot that was poached and then you'd make a bechamel that you would load up with creme fraiche and put that over the lamb's foot so it's probably wouldn't be bad but that's really how it all got started and then came the french revolution when all the royalty were deposed and many of the wealthy and that you know they all had private chefs so the private chefs are without a job so what did they do they do what chefs always do and we are seeing chefs do it today they figured it out and they went out and opened public eating houses. Okay. And that's, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world today, I am so admirative of chefs because chefs think on their feet and anybody who's been one knows that you've got to be quick, imaginative and supple. Um, and they were, they were in France. And so we came up with this, they came up with this plat du jour. Maybe that's all they offered was one dish. Just one dish. Every day. Mm-hmm. Different every day, seasonal quality, mm-hmm. what the farmers of the agriculture was offering them. Right. And there is another um, angle to plat du jour, which is that it also is a way to use leftovers. And I hate the word leftovers because it has a bad name, but there's a recipe in plat du jour for something called hachis parmentier. It's uh, basically a lamb roast that you mix with vegetables and you top with mashed potatoes and you put it in the oven and it is the best thing you ever ate. <laughs> that sounds good. I did see that. I was looking through my book too to find it. So, and I think we've talked about that before with regards to this concept of leftovers. We need to ter- change that term because it's really just about being creative in your kitchen with what you have and using it when it's fresh and not necessarily living by a recipe, but being inspired by recipes and then working with what you have. There's also another aspect to that, and the French are really good at this. They don't waste anything. So you've got leftovers. They, will, A French chef or cook will figure out a wonderful way to do it and to, something to do with it. And you know, I think most people know what a croissant aux amandes is, an almond croissant. So in France, that was yesterday's croissant that was uh, had some... Kirsch and some sugar syrup poured on it, some almond paste put on top, almonds on top, and then it was put back in the oven. It was a way to use leftover croissant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did not know that. Uh, yeah. And it's, it sounds simple in, in, you know, when you do it, it's just a matter of thinking about that and thinking outside the box and not being so forced into that recipe um, that maybe you shouldn't be using it because it's winter and you're in summer or, or it's from winter and you're in summer or whatever. Um, 
you will always get better quality when you eat with the seasons and you know, things during the season are abundant. They're usually less expensive and their flavors better. And we're talking now in the winter, but root vegetables, beautiful winter salads, uh, certain seafood they're right now. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and that's uh, what I also want to let the re- listeners know. Your book is not just recipes. Your entire, let's see, your entire eleventh chapter is all about basics: the basic sauces, the basic um, broths, and then the introduction. It's full. It's not just a one-page introduction. You have a full introduction that talks to readers about the basics, um, or not the basics, the seasonality that you just spoke about, quality produce, and why it's absolutely a focus on on that with regards to seasonality garnishing the French way and talk, you talk about food labels. So just to kind of give them a taste of that introduction, can you talk about the garnishing the French way and um, why that is something to pay attention to? How does that make a difference? Well, you know, the adage, we eat with our eyes before we ever taste anything. So it's really important to make a beautiful plate. And that doesn't mean complicated. So what it means is that You've, made, you've gone to the trouble to cook whatever it might be. It might be poached fish. It might be a roast pork. So when you cut it and put it on a plate, you want it to look beautiful. So the, a French person would put a sprig of thyme, uh, a leaf of parsley, an edible flower blossom. And I did give a list of ed- edible flower blossoms because I don't want anybody to get sick. You know, and uh, I just, and, but also, if you look at the list, it's very long. I was just going to say, it's a long list. I think it's going to surprise people and delight them too. To, oh, it's not that hard to find. I can find that. Yeah. I mean, and who knew that bachelor buttons were edible or chrysanthemums or, you know, hibiscus or calendula? I mean, we do use those here. But but I think normally you would think, oh, well, those are for putting in a vase and then I'll, I won't even decorate. And I can never understand why people don't just garnish a tiny bit. bit. It makes a big difference. You always did that with every single meal that we sat down with. When we arrived for our welcome dinner, you had little details with regards to all of what you've just spoken about. And it just... It just completed the welcome and it completed the invitation, I guess you could say, to sit down, enjoy, and and just, yeah, take in all the flavors that are right here. I, I just, those, they, they make a difference. They make a big difference. Well, it's also kind of honoring your guest because you've thought about them and you've thought about how, how can I sort of entice and seduce them into this moment yeah. that we're going to spend together at the table. Well described. Well, and speaking of that, you mentioned briefly um, at the beginning of our conversation that you're full time in Paris. So I just have to ask, as someone who's been in your kitchen in, in Louvier's Louvier, are you permanently gone? Is that sold? Is your house sold? No, the house is not sold. I rented it to the mayor of the town. Um, so he and his family live there now, and I needed um, honestly, I needed to open a new chapter of my life. And um, you know, I raised my children in Louvier. My friends are. I have a, a lovely community there. I have a fabulous kitchen there, but uh, but I needed to do something else. So I'm I'm now in a very small apartment, but beautiful in Paris. I have a tiny kitchen, and I'm working on a video uh, platform called Dancing Tomatoes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, yeah. I want to make sure listeners and readers know about this. Tell us about Dancing Tomatoes. Number one, where the name come from? Love it. Makes me smile to say. Well, it. you know, I mean, it all it all was a result of confinement um, because we were heavily confined in France. We literally had one hour out of day. So I got to know my neighbors. And there were many neighbors. Most people fled to the countryside, but I got to know my neighbors, one of whom turned out to be a videographer who a fashion designer, videographer, lost his job. I mean, of course, nobody had any work. So we got to talking and I don't quite know how it evolved, but we decided to do this project together. He's the, he's what I, the videographer, I'm the, the talent, they call it. (laughs) And we literally went through a list of 800 million names to come up with one that we liked that wasn't taken. And we hit on dancing tomatoes. And what we wanted was joyful because we wanted happy. We wanted light because I am instructing in these videos and I'm very serious about what I do. But the tone is, you can do this. 
this is really a great, great way to spend your time. And that does come across. I and hope it does. I hope it does. Space. No, it's, yeah, it's lovely. I've watched a couple of them. It's a warm space. Is it Sammy that's the photographer? Uh, yes. Video? Yeah. Great job. It's very welcoming and inviting. And as you said, you're learning something very specific. This is a tutorial, but at the same time, you are going to be invited wanting to tune in to watch it. It's, it's well done. Well, done. Well, we have a lot of things in store and I'll let you know when our next um, big segment rolls out. But for now we're on YouTube and we have a blog and, you know, it's just really, really fun. I mean, I'm having a great time, Sam. We work really well together and it's funny because my kitchen is, is tiny, two burners and an oven. And you know what? I can do almost everything. And that's, I love that because I want people to cook. And I don't want people to think they have to have a big fancy kitchen to do that. They don't. You're, you're so right. Yeah. They need the skills. They just need And the confidence to try. Yes. And, and maybe a friend in the kitchen. And that's what I am really wanting to be is that friend who, you know, gives you the tips, who makes it possible. Uh, and ultimately there will be a conversation developed over this because, you know, we've got plans for lots of things and I'm dying to do the one-on-ones and all that kind of thing. So it's really fun. Oh, well, I'm excited to see where that goes. That's a great addition. And speaking of that, I know listeners are curious who know you. Are you still going to have cooking classes when things start to be lit? Well, I'm doing private classes now, uh, very tiny. Uh, I will by request. I will only do it by request. Um, I really have so many, so many things that I'm working on. Um, but I'm a teacher, so yes, I will. But I won't have a program like I had before. Now I'm going to take a quick break to introduce one sponsor. But when we return, Susan's going to talk about what it's like to be living in Paris right now during the time of the pandemic. She's also going to walk us through her cookbook and talk about a couple of winter recipes. You will definitely want to explore. And if nothing else, it will make you become very hungry as you're listening, no matter whether you're full or not. And we're going to talk about a few other things as well, which includes her petite plaisir. I'll be right back. Bombas makes the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. They've literally rethought every little detail of the socks we wear to make them way more comfortable. I wear them every day that I go out walking or go skiing, and they stay on my feet, they cozy me in, and they last, well, they're still lasting. I've had the same pair for over a year now. But these socks do more than keep feet cozy. They help give back to the most vulnerable members of our community, because for every pair of socks you purchase, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. The generosity of Bombas customers has allowed them to donate over 40 million pairs of socks and counting through their nationwide network of 3,000 plus giving partners. Now, as a simple, sophisticated listener, when you buy a pair, you get to give a pair and get 20% off your first purchase when you do so at bombas.com slash sophisticate. That's bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash sophisticate. Okay, so I'm curious, you've been in Paris during this entire time of the pandemic. What has your experience been? What has it been like? Because I know the curfew keeps changing and you went back into lockdown. What has been your experience? Well, uh, at the very beginning in March, I was supposed to be, I was on my way to Iceland for three months to work and write at a writer's um, retreat. So of course, lockdown came, all trips were canceled. And what followed was, I guess, till June, we were confined, allowed outside for one hour a day. And we had to sign ourselves in and sign ourselves out. And that was on a piece of paper. So actually, I had just gotten this wonderful project to ghostwrite a book. So I had a lot of time. I mean, I'm still working on it. But you know, so I had a job. And you know, I guess the hard part was not seeing anybody. I have a neighbor across the street. I saw him, and um, and Paris emptied. There were no cars. So honestly, 
it was kind of amazing. <laughs> I mean, I would go out for an hour and the thing about signing yourself out is it's on your honor. So, you know, you go out for an hour and walk for an hour. And if you're not quite home, you, you're probably not going to get caught. And then because the project I was working on requires me to go kind of up north into the northern arrondissement to get ingredients and things, I kind of had a laissez-passer so that I could go further than the one kilometer that officially I was allowed. So for me, it went really well. I mean, I missed everyone, but it went really well. And we started all, you know, I had a, one friend we talked every day, another, well, two friends we talked every day. And so it was all right. It was all right. I mean, I'm just like everybody else, you know, and Paris was beautiful. I mean, it was spring. So it was kind of blessed in a certain sense aside from the horrors of what was actually happening. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, you know, and that's, you know, for those of us that are fortunate enough to be healthy and have have the opportunity to work from home or however we work, we're able to make it work. It, you know, it gave a lot of, of us a breath, a, a breath yeah. to catch our breath. And, and you kind of had your city back as far as the tourism was was reduced. We still, we still do. We still do. I mean, okay. there are no tourists to speak of. I mean, of course there are a few, but, um, but then it was amazing, but I mean, everything was closed. I mean, yeah. everything but bakeries and grocery stores. Now everything's open. Is it okay? I was gonna ask uh, except for restaurants and cafes. Um, there's, there are cafes though. They put tables outside so you can't sit, but you can lean if there are only two people. And so um, it is possible to get a coffee when you're on the street, but you can't go sit anywhere. And, you know, so we had the first confinement the confinement that was drastic. Then we had a second one. And by then the, the permission slips were uh, on our phones and that was simple. Oh, okay. So really it's, you know, now it's just a matter of now we're under curfew. So we have to be in at six. That's, and that's early, isn't that compared to what it was? Wasn't it eight? It was eight. Oh. And so the way we, what we did at eight is I have a little group of friends, you know, I see from time to time, not all together, but so we'd have a drink between six and eight and then you're home by eight. And then you have your evening to, if you're me, you work or whatever. Now you have to be home by six. So I am serious. Somebody invited me for an aperitif at 4.30. I mean, I'm ready for tea at 4.30. <laughs> well, and I, I remember listening to, I'm not sure who it was in the French administration, say that the apero hour was causing the problem because people were gathering. Is yeah. that, can you explain what that what that what they meant by well, that? Well, the apero is a wonderful moment in French life. And... They also call it the after work, after work. So what was really causing the problem is that people have to work. It's like anywhere you go out and you have a beer, you go out and you have wine. And in France, it's an institution. So friends get together. I get together with lots of people for a glass of wine at, say, 6.30 or 7. And then you do that, and maybe you'll end up having dinner together. Usually you do. You know, usually the apéro segues into dinner. So somebody will invite you for an apéro but you should go with an empty stomach knowing you're going to eat. And so what, what I heard the problem was is that people who were working were getting together after work and not respecting the boundaries. And cases, it's, it's how many cases are, you know, we're, we want to be down to 5,000 a day in France, and we're still up around 20,000. So not deaths, not deaths, just cases. And we're looking at a potential reconfinement because of, these new strains that are coming along. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And they, they have let kids go back to school quite a while ago. And now they've let high school kids and college kids go back to school part-time, which is great. Okay. They're back yeah. part, yeah. part-time only. Part-time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, and I want to really quickly get back to the cookbook for one more thing, because since they're going, we're, you know, they're in their houses by six o'clock, we, you know, it's winter time. You mentioned seasonality. Can you select a recipe from your cookbook that you would recommend readers, uh, listeners going to, to bring in that winter seasonal flavor that um, will give them a taste of what your cookbook's all about? Oh, there's so many, um, you know, uh, there's... There's a beautiful salad that is uh, winter lettuce. It's um, curly endive, and you can use escarole, and you have to get some bacon, really good bacon, and you have to get goat cheese, and you have to get bread, 
So what you do is you cook the bacon and then you add uh, vinegar to the pan with the bacon in it and shake it around and that becomes your vinaigrette. But before you do that, you cut the goat cheese in half, put them on a piece of toast and put them in the oven so the goat cheese starts to melt. So you make your bacon, put your vinaigrette, and then you dress your lettuce with that wonderful bacony, vinegary, garlicky. There's garlic. And then on top, there's lots of bacon. And then on top of each salad, you serve them. You put a toast with goat cheese on top, or maybe two. And that is a warm salad, which says, screams winter. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other thing, I mean, there are a million dishes in here, but, you know, there's Boeuf Bourguignon. There's an incredible pizza that has, again, bacon, cream, and onions on the on top of it. Uh, that's a really great winter dish. There's a dish I love that is called Carbonade. It's on page 137. Okay. And it's beef, onions, shallots, and spice bread that is all braised in beer. Ooh, I see. And, okay. yeah, it's really wonderful. And I make the spice bread. There's a recipe in the book for it. It's a fabulous bread that you can then, you know, the leftovers you'll use for toast in the morning. Or you buy your spice bread, you put all your ingredients together, and it slow cooks. And this gives you the most rich, most unusually yummy kind of stew that's tender with these hint of spices in the background. And I just serve it with plain boiled potatoes, like a true French person would. It looks, it looks, so, wonderful, but I, like you said, it's yeah. full of flavor. Oh my gosh. There's another really fun thing that you can, you know, I think of it as winter, but you make a gratin, a potato gratin. And you, you know, I, the recipe in this book is the best potato gratin ever. And then you just flip a steak. Oh, okay. You know, you sear it on either side. You put a big knob of butter on top of the steak and you serve it with a gratin. Oh, I'm looking at that potato and, right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that'll keep you warm. They're just, you know, all these dishes are simple. They're hearty. Uh, some of them are quite contemporary. You know, they're elegant. But none of them are going to really make you, they're all doable. Yeah. Um, couscous, the soup for couscous is fabulous. Okay. So it's lamb and root vegetables. It's a very wintry dish. And if you can make the couscous, you know, buy your couscous and follow my directions, you are going to be amazed, amazed at how good it is. I think that I think you've whetted so many people's appetites right now. We're all, no matter when they're listening to this, we're now hungry and ready to get in our kitchens. <laughs> so, <'cause> I am. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, what can I make tonight? I, I really, I, I forgot about this question. I really want to ask about Baptiste because you, you very kindly introduced us to Baptiste. Um, one of the, I, you would call him a, 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 a gar, I mean, he's, what would you call him? Cause he's, he's a market gardener. He's a market gardener. Okay. Just so jolly and lovely, but there's a lovely picture of him in the book. And the, oh, well, he's like my younger brother. I mean, we're very, very close. I mean, I met him at the market twenty some years ago, and so I feel like I've watched him grow up. He took over his uncle's farm, and he his produce is unlike anyone else's. I, I if I miss really, that's what I miss the most is. And every Saturday morning, we had coffee together every for years with the whoever chef was at the market, whichever chef. So I miss that, of course. Um, I do find beautiful produce in Paris from farmers who drive in. They come in to the markets, and it's taken me over a year to find produce that, he, that approximates what Betty's grows in Normandy. Well, I know you, you regularly were talking and praising him and speaking and speaking highly of him. What, can you speak to the, because you have a section in your book about the market gardener. Why is this something of a treasure? Because he really is a treasure based on the stories you've told. And Yep. Well, what I love about Baptiste is his, he's, I mean, he's become someone so close to me, but also he represents something that I hold very dear, which is, you know, a, a young person, he was 21 when he got started. Now he's in his 40s. He now is married, has a child, is a farmer, and has the time occasionally to take a few days off, hmm. to go ski, <laughs> to take his family somewhere. He um, he makes quite a good living. 
he has a normal life. Let's put it that way. You know, I sponsored these wine tastings at my house. I mean, I hosted them for 20 years. He came to every wine tasting. So what I think I love about the symbol of Baptiste is he works really hard. He works deathly hard, but he has time to enjoy life. And that's what it should be like for a farmer who's supplying us our food. And it isn't always like that. It's like the work is hard, the money's poor, the this. And Baptiste has figured out a way to bring it all together. And he, he's tired a lot of the times, but he's always up for a good meal and a great glass of wine. He's, out, he's and in a very good mood. He's just great. wonderful. Yeah. He's just, and even if he's not, he's just, you know, he's just wants to join in and will not let his um, big work schedule stop him. Okay. Well, that was a pleasure to meet him. And I love that you have that picture, but also a description of what your, what his role and his, his, his place in your world, but in the larger context of France's agriculture world is and why they're just so invaluable. I mean, that's just. Oh. Well, I just think that anybody could use him as a model, no matter what country and say, you know, if he can do it, I can probably do it. It's hard work. No doubt about it. Yeah. A lot of risk involved. Yeah. But he just does it because he believes firmly, number one, in uh, keeping the family land together. Number two, in providing his clients with the best vegetables he can. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, and we have one more question. You know how this works. The final question is sharing of a petit plaisir. Now, I have to share with you that um, on our first conversation, episode 192, you shared about the blue hour. And I have yeah. listeners and readers share with me that they love that so much and they were just so inspired by it so i i'm of course now more curious than ever i'm curious what what is another petit plaisir plaisir that you would like to share with listeners about how you enjoy your every days oh it's so interesting that's such a good question shannon um i do work at home and now with confinement i'm you know i spend a lot of time by herself but i guess my petit plaisir is the 10 o'clock cup of coffee oh. and I'm very picky about my coffee I have a wonderful coffee maker that is not an espresso it's an actual uh like an espresso machine that I've had for a long time uh Francis Francis is the brand and it's a beautiful little machine so I you know I get up I do my thing and then at 10 o'clock I'm hungry and I want a cup of coffee so I take time out from the workday. I make myself the best cup of coffee, which I drink from a bowl, okay. the way the French drink their coffee in the morning. And I take whatever time is necessary. And I have a window that looks out over the rooftops of Paris. So I just enjoy my coffee. And I don't read the paper. I will probably listen to the news, but I just take that time with my coffee. Yeah. And that is really something I look forward to. It's very special and it happens every day. I love it. And, you know, it's just the most pleasurable moment. And I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if I have friends staying with me or whatever. That is like a sacred moment. Even if I'm working, if we're filming for Dancing Tomatoes at 10 o'clock, we take time. And I have that, that bowl of coffee. And I just think it's really special. It's, I'm not a routine person, but that's kind of a routine. That's your routine. Well, it's a yeah. rejuvenating one to kind of, that's for you, but it's not just a, it's not just one that's because it's important. It's, it's mandatory for the rest of the day. It's elegant. It's elegant. You know, my coffee bowl is important to me, the, the way it feels, the way the coffee smells. And when you look forward to things, and that's one of the beauties of French food and eating seasonally. When you look forward to something that's in season, you have to wait. You know, the anticipation builds. Yeah. And so when you actually sit down and enjoy it, it's fabulous. It really is. Every day. Every day. And you can look forward to that. <laughs> yes. Thank you for reminding yeah. us to to anticipate and enjoy that anticipation as much as the moment itself. That is a duly worthwhile thing to incorporate into our lives i think thank you very much for sharing that well thank you for asking <laughs> well i i like i said i do i've had listeners and readers reach out and say the blue hour i love it i think it's a great idea and i know people will be saying the same thing about the 10 o'clock hour now i just have a feeling susan's new cookbook is plat de jour french dinners made easy it is available now it is absolutely a must-have in your cookbook library Thank you so much for joining us today, Susan. 
Well, thank you, Shannon. I really enjoyed it. And thank you to all your wonderful listeners. You can check out all that we talked about in our conversation today on the show notes, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 300. And I've shared a picture of the first recipe she shared in our conversation, the curly endive salad with hot bacon and goat cheese. I highly recommend it. I've enjoyed it twice now. Um, I found escarola, as she mentioned, was an alternative for the lettuce greens or the greens. And it was lovely. There's so many recipes I'm looking forward to trying in this book. Plat du jour, French dinners made easy by Susan Herman Loomis. Wishing you a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up my latest book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Everydays Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self, now available on Audible and wherever audiobooks are sold, as well as in paperback and ebook versions. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide, which is also available in paperback, ebook, and as an audiobook as well. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or cup of morning coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.